Welcome, everyone. So glad that you're here with us. Happy Fourth of July to all of our Central family in the States. Don't you love living in a land of the free and all the sacrifice that was made for that freedom? So thankful you're here with us. I hope your long weekend is filled, filled with lots of celebration and family and friends, and we're just so thankful that you're here uh, making us a part of your celebration this weekend. And speaking of friends and friendship, that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about this weekend, how to make new friends, keep friends, be more loyal friends, because friendship can be tricky, right? Friends can be hard. Making new friends can be hard. I love this kid's take on friendship. Check this video out. Why is it so hard making new friends? I mean, I have friends. I just think I outgrow them. Bobby's cool, but... Bobby eats crayons. I used to like Amanda until she said my hair looks crazy. So I met this dude that's part Jared. Our mommy told us to stay in the sand area. I like Star Wars, he likes Star Wars. Cool, this is my new bro. Then boom, he went to the grass area. I'm like, oh, you rebel, huh, Jared? I'm not about that life. My mama don't play that. <laughs> My mama don't play that, Jared, you rebel. I think we all have a few Jareds in our life, or maybe you are the Jared, you are the rebel. But hey, this weekend, we're gonna be talking about friendship and looking at it based on God's example to us, what it looks like to have a loyal heart. And last week, Pastor Judd shared an incredible message on how God used the hard times in David's life to create a humble heart in his future king, all while he's being chased around by the current king, King Saul. And this week, we're gonna look at those same hard times that David went through to create a loyal heart in his future king. So just a little quick recap, David was a little boy. He didn't come off as much, but he carried an anointing from God. He was the only one that had the courage to stand up to a giant and be the Israelite hero. And while quickly getting the attention of the whole nation, David stays humble and submiss submits himself to whatever King Saul needs of him. He stays humble and submissive to authority, and this allows David to prosper. But then this evil spirit comes over Saul and Saul starts seeing David as a threat, even though he's loyal. So David finds himself on the run for his life from King Saul. And in this challenging time, God knows that David is gonna need a friend by his side. And that friend's gonna need to be incredibly loyal. So today, we're gonna be looking at that loyal friendship between David and Jonathan, who happened to be King Saul's son. Now, David and Jonathan, they weren't just acquaintances or casual friends. They were the best of friends. And their friendship struck up really rather quickly. Check out what 1 Samuel 18 has to say about it. When we get to the red word, say that out loud with us. But it says, after David had finished talking with Saul, he met Jonathan, the king's son. There was an immediate bond between them. For Jonathan loved David. And Jonathan made a solemn pact with David because he loved him as he loved himself. This was an immediate friendship, an immediate bond. This was two people that just became fast friends, like they immediately knew they were gonna be best friends. It's like from that scene from that movie, Step Brothers, where they're like, did we just become best friends? Yep. And yes, if you're new to church, I did just quote Step Brothers in church. But hey, <laughs> finding a best friend isn't always that easy, right? It can be hard. Because loyalty in a friend can be hard to come by these days, especially quickly. The New York Times recently did this poll, they did this study where they asked people how many close friends they had in their life. And they did the same poll back in 1990. And in 1990, when they did the poll, they found that the majority of the people that they interviewed, the majority of the answers they got, the largest percentage would say that they have 10 or more close friends in their life. But when they did the same study, the same poll, just this last year, post the pandemic, they found out that most people would say, the largest percentage would say that they have three or less close friends in their life. And the saddest part about the poll just this last year is that 12% would say they have zero close friends in their lives. So let me tell you this, whether you have 10 or more close friends, whether you have a couple close friends, or you don't have anyone that meets that description, 
What I can tell you is that the quality of our lives is often determined by the quality of our relationships. And the story of David and Jonathan's friendship, it not only shows us the power of a loyal heart, but it reflects the faithfulness of God. If we wanna live a life that is able to stay on purpose, but also is filled with joy and reward, then we need quality relationships in our lives. We need friends to join us in the journey, especially in the hard times. Friends that can lift us up when we feel weak. But the problem is, I think oftentimes, we don't uh, give loyalty before we receive loyalty. We expect others to be loyal and dedicated to us before we'll give them our loyalty. We're so afraid of being hurt that that people need to prove themselves before we'll show, show our loyalty back to them, before we'll drop our guard. But if we want loyal and dedicated friendships and relationships, it starts with showing loyalty before receiving loyalty. So today, let's look at David and Jonathan, and let's find out how we can develop a loyal heart, how we can invest in friends and, and choose friends and be a good friend. Let's look at things just like what we sung, sung in that song just a second ago. Let's look at the way God looks at things, see things from heaven's point of view. And the first thing we're gonna see when it comes to friendship is that loyal friends sacrifice. One Saturday, a couple years ago, I was on my way to church, on my way here, and I was driving my truck on the freeway, and all of a sudden I noticed it started shaking. It started wobbling. It was having a hard time. It was struggling. And I immediately knew that I had a flat tire. So what do you do when you have a flat tire? You just floor it to the place you're going so you can keep as much air in the tire as possible, right? <laughs> I'm messing, that's not what I did, I pulled over, although I was very tempted just to hurry to the next place, to hurry to the church because I was late. I needed to be here in 30 minutes, I was to be on stage, I was hosting, so this had to be the fastest tire change I had ever done. And when I went to the back seat to lift it up, to get the truck jack and to get the tire iron, they weren't there. Why does it seem like every time you're in an emergency situation, you need to change a tire, the tools you need are not in the vehicle? Has anybody else experienced this? You're on the side, where do these things go? I don't, I, do the kids take them? I don't know, but they're gone. So I had to call my buddy Kyle and see if he was in the area, which Kyle picked up and he happened to be five minutes away. He's like, I'll bring you a tire iron, I'll bring you a truck jack, I'm on my way. And he was there in five minutes. He got there so quickly. And when he got out of his truck, he didn't immediately go for the tire iron for the jack, he just tossed me his keys. He's like, here, take my truck, go. He could see that I was in distress, that I was scared I was gonna be late, and he's like, you just go. I'm like, no, this is my responsibility, I need to take care of this, you, this isn't yours. He's like, seriously, just go. I'll get the tire figured out, I'll come meet you in a bit, you're in a hurry, take my truck and go. He not only sacrificed his time, but he sacrificed his vehicle for me. That is a loyal friend. Hey, you can give that up for Kyle. Look at what the Bible says in verse four of chapter 18, after David and Jonathan immediately struck up this friendship. It says, Jonathan sealed the pack by taking off his robe and giving it to David, together with his tunic, his sword, bow, and belt. Jonathan wanted to give David something that was personal to him, something that meant something to him. Remember, Jonathan is the son of a king, so he would have been standing there in royal clothing, the clothing of a prince. And Jonathan gives David his royal robe and his weapons as a sign and a pledge of his friendship. And this would have been seen as a huge honor. Because remember, David is most likely standing there in the clothing of a shepherd. And Jonathan's like, this, this just won't do. You should be standing here in the clothes of a prince. And remember, it's Jonathan's succession to the throne that David threatens. If there's anyone that could see David's future kingship as a threat other than King Saul himself, it would be King Saul's son, Jonathan. But Jonathan saw things differently. He saw his role as being the future king's friend, and he made sure his new friend was dressed the part. Take a second and just assess yourself real quick. Are you the type of friend that would sacrifice your time, your resources, your advantages for your friends? In your relationships, are you seeking more to give than to receive? Jonathan, 
He, he lived out this value of self-sacrifice and it's the example that God gives to us by sacrificing his son Jesus to show us this sort of love. And it's this sacrifice that he calls us to make for others to be generous in our relationships, willing to make sacrifices for the sake of others because that's the kind of love God has exampled himself to us. And at the same time you think about your own self-sacrifice, think about the friendships you currently have. Are you surrounded by people that strive to live selflessly? Do they give more to your friendship than they take? Are you in the sort of friendships that God would want for you? Do your friends help you grow closer to Jesus? Because if so, invest in those relationships. Jonathan and David, they knew this principle and they started their friendship from the beginning with self-sacrifice. Woodrow Wilson, the former president of the United States, once said, loyalty means nothing unless it has at its heart the absolute principle of self-sacrifice. Simply put, there is no loyalty if there is no self-sacrifice. And this leads us to the second way we can know what a loyal friend looks like and be a loyal friend, and that is that loyal friends defend. I once was out golfing with my buddy Brandon when we were 16 years old. We felt it was so grown up of this, it was so mature of us if we got out on the golf course first thing in the morning at 6 a.m., if we grabbed that first tea time we were adulting, we were having studious man conversations on the golf course, talking about all that life was gonna bring us. That might be how we felt, but we were still just boys on a golf course, taking the golf carts and playing bumper cars with them or ramping them over sand traps, taking way more shots than we should at each hole. Golf shots, guys, we're 16, golf shots at each hole. And each, each, I can remember this one hole in particular, I took way too many shots. Now, I, I am a bad golfer. I am not great at all. So every golf shot I took would either go left, it would go right, and not just a little bit, like way onto other uh, courses, or way onto other uh, holes. So I didn't even go look for those golf balls. I just considered them lost. And so I took shot after shot after shot, just trying to get something to go straight down this fairway, straight down the middle. And Brandon started to notice that we're holding up the group behind us. They're starting to catch up with us. And he didn't want the course marshal to come and bust us. So he's like, we gotta get moving. We gotta, we gotta go. No more, no more shots here. We gotta go. And he just starts walking down the middle of the fairway. As if to say, I'm here now. I'm walking down the course. You can't take any more shots because you're, you're, I'm here. My presence is here. Do you think this stopped me? <laughs> no. I still put another ball down on that tee. And let me tell you, there was nothing in me that felt like Brandon was in any sort of danger. Because like I said, everything was going left, everything was going right. I thought even if I connected and it went straight, it's gonna go up over him. He's only 50 yards away now, like surely it'll just go way past him. But when I connected with that ball, it hit off that tee like a missile and it just shot straight into the middle of Brandon's back. I can still hear the sound. He shrugged his shoulders back and threw his club. I thought, oh no. I ran, I apologized. It was so dumb, it was so stupid of me. I did not mean to hit you. You have to know that my intentions were not to hit you. And you know what, he believed me. He immediately believed me. He never even questioned me. He wasn't mad at me. And for the rest of our lives, he's never even brought that incident back up. And with that, we've been friends for over 34 years and I've had other accidents or there's been other times that my intentions could be misconstrued. But Brandon has always been a friend to defend me when I'm not around. He's had my back and I've never had to question that. Even after an accidental moment where I literally did not have his back. And in the story of David and Jonathan, remember, David at one point is being hunted by Jonathan's father, who's King Saul, because of this tormenting spirit that's come over Saul. And instead of seeing the good in David, Saul became jealous and saw David as a threat and wanted to kill him. But Jonathan would come to his best friend's defense. We read in Samuel 19, the next morning, Jonathan spoke with his father about David, saying many good things about him. The king must not sin against his servant, David, Jonathan said. He's never done anything to harm you. He has always helped you in any way he could. 
Jonathan goes on to remind his dad, like, this is the same kid, this is the same boy that took on that giant, that had the courage to fight for you, for your kingship, for this nation. He stood up for you. He's been nothing but loyal. He's been nothing but trustworthy. He's proven himself to you. And as we go on to read, we read that Saul listened to his son's defense of David's innocence and responded, as surely as the Lord lives, David will not be killed. Now we're gonna see that we can't trust what Saul has to say here, but the point is that Jonathan immediately came to his friend's defense. He stood up not only to his own dad, but to the king to say, you're in the wrong here, dad. Your your, your thinking is off. David hasn't been anything but loyal to you. He rebuked his father's decision to make David an enemy, even though it might have benefited Jonathan for his dad to dislike David. He defended his friend. And this is an example that loyal friends have your back. They don't speak negatively about you to others. They're not one way with you and a different way without you. When others speak negatively against you, you know what they do? They always assume the best and they defend you. It it makes me think, am I this type of friend? Are you this type of friend? Do, Do we assume the best in others? Do we defend someone when they're being poorly talked about or wronged? Are we the type of friends that no one would question our loyalty based on what comes out in our conversations? Because you see, a true friend defends you in your absence. So invest in the friendships that always assume the best in you. And in return, come to the defense of others when they're not around. Which brings us to the next way that we can develop a loyal heart, and that is to know that loyal friends help. There was one point in Laura and I, my wife, uh, in our lives that we became and held the role of landlord. And this isn't anything we ever aspired to be based on a, a really long story of unfortunate circumstances back in 2006 when we bought our first townhome and then the housing market crashed. At one point, our townhome was worth half of what we paid for it. And we decided to weather that storm, to hold on to it, but in order to do so, we needed to get tenants into the house to help make the mortgage payment. And we had a whole variety of tenants live in this home. We had some tenants that looked like they never even moved in. I don't know what they were doing. It didn't look like they lived there. We had some tenants that decided to play their own like DIY renovations on the place. And they were very DIY, if you know what I mean. Like it did not look good. They were not uh, skilled in this area of their life. We had some tenants that just straight neglected the place. And so it was always this fun box of surprises anytime a tenant would move out and we got to see what we were walking into. The last time especially, the house had finally come to a point where we could sell it for pretty much what we put into it and we wanted out. We didn't wanna be tenant, our landlords, we never wanted to, so let's sell the place. And so we gave our tenants the proper notice, our intentions to sell, and that we needed them to move out. And they got out of there and once they were, I walked the place to see what I had ahead of me. And I really only had one weekend to get this place ready to get it on the market. And when I walked in, the baseboards were filthy. The walls all needed to be painted. Portions of the flooring needed to be tore up and redone. The backyard grass was completely dead. There were electrical issues. Lighting was going out all over the house. The uh, plumbing issues upstairs were horrible. In fact, around the upstairs toilet, the toilet had been leaking and the subfloor had completely rotted away where you could see down through the floor. This toilet was one bad sit down away from somebody going through the floor, through the downstairs ceiling and probably having their last bathroom incident that they've ever been a part of. It was awful. And I knew I had me and a weekend to get it all done. So I text all my friends up. I said, I need help. I put everybody in a group chat. I just said, anybody that can come through, come help me get this place ready. I would really appreciate any help I could get. And every single one of them responded that they would be there. Now, this isn't the type of text that you'd wanna get from a friend. This isn't what you, how you see your weekend going or changing to, but they all showed up. And we actually had a lot of fun and made some memories doing it. And I think you need to ask them if they feel like they had a lot of fun, if they made memories. But nonetheless, I thought it was fun because I did it with friends that did it with a happy and fun spirit. I did it with others. What seemed like a stressful and impossible task turned into a fun and memorable weekend because I did it with friends that were willing and happy to jump in and help. 
And we're gonna see, we're gonna see that helpfulness was at the center of David and Jonathan's friendship as well. Now, like I said earlier, we, we can't trust what King Saul was saying when he was saying that he wasn't still trying to kill David. And honestly, David didn't trust his words either. David believes that Saul is still trying to kill him and he's trying to tell Jonathan that he believes that this is the case. And Jonathan tells him that's nonsense, that his father would tell him if that was the case, but David still knows better and swears to Jonathan that he is a step away from death. And I love what Jonathan inquires next. He says in chapter 20, verse four, tell me what I can do to help you, Jonathan exclaimed. No more questioning, no more trying to make it sound like his friend was crazy. He wasn't doing that in the first place. He, and there was no more defending the intentions of others. He just simply says, I can see you're in distress, David. I can see you're upset. So what can I do to help you? And Jonathan does help. Together they devise this pretty elaborate plan to find out, first of all, if his dad's intentions, if King Saul's intentions were to kill David. And if they were, it's not like he could just come and tell David, come find David and tell him himself because King Saul would have had Jonathan followed to find out David's location. So they devised this plan where David is to hide behind this pile of stones and that Jonathan would come out to do some bow and arrow target practice. And if David was safe, if his dad's intentions were not to kill David, then Jonathan would shoot the arrow short of the target, short, short of the stone pile, and send a boy to retrieve the area short of David's location. But if David was in danger, if King Saul was trying to kill David, then Jonathan would shoot the arrow over the target, over the stone pile, and send a boy to retrieve it and say, go farther, the arrows are still ahead of you. This would have been the signal to David that David's life was in danger and the Lord was sending him away, which ends up being the case. But what we can see through this story is that a friend stops at nothing to help. When you have in your gut that something isn't right, when you're in distress, when you feel helpless or in trouble, they don't try to convince you that you're wrong or that you're crazy. These are what you would call your 3 a.m. friends, the type of friends that are gonna not only pick up the phone at three in the morning because your car broke down, but they're gonna show up in a hurry to help you get home. The type of friends that you can call in the middle of the night because you're upset or you're distressed and they don't try to shame you. They don't try to make you feel guilty for them losing sleep. They say, tell me what I can do to help you. I'm coming over. Now listen, just because they don't pick up doesn't mean that they don't care. Sometimes you just miss a phone call. I don't want you guys all testing your friends tonight at 3 a.m. and deciding if they're loyal friends or not. <laughs> but that availability, it's the same loyalty that God shows us. He's always available. He's always accessible. 3 a.m., 4 a.m., it doesn't matter. He does not rest. He cares when you're in distress. He makes himself available to help, and all we have to do is ask. And this kind of friend is the friend that God calls us to be. I saw this video this last week on my social media feed, and I think it speaks perfectly to what I'm talking about right now. Check this video out. And I know when I need it, I can count on you. Like four, three, two, and you'll be there. Cause that's what friends are supposed to do. Oh, yeah. Ah, sometimes all we need is a shoulder, right? And I don't know if you caught those lyrics behind that video, but it says, I can count on you like four, three, two, and you'll be there. Because that's what friends are supposed to do. That's the kind of love that God shows us. That's how we should look, show the love of God. Because God loves us in our darkest hours we can be a light to others and theirs. And that leads me to the last way that we can be a loyal friend, and that is that loyal friends encourage. Over the years, I've been blessed to be surrounded by some incredible friendships. Friends that lift me up when I feel weak, Friends that are much younger than me, friends that are going through similar life phases, the same age as me, friends that have gone ahead of me, had more experiences than I have, and now they're incredible mentors. 
friends that I've been lifelong friends with that have moved away, but we've stayed close. The distance didn't separate us. Friends that I can call best friends and one best friend specifically that I also get to call my wife. They all help me stay in the game. They help me keep going by encouraging me in my low points. And, and I don't say any of this to brag, although they all deserve to be bragged on. I say it because I know I could not be where I am today without their presence in my life. That it's not so much about what I'm doing in life, but who I'm doing it with. I've been able to journey the darkest and hardest parts of my life because God gave me these friends the type of friends that remind me of God's love for me. And after Jonathan warns David that his life is in danger from his father, David spends the next portion of his life on the run. He's constantly being hunted. He's never able to rest. He's never able to feel safe. He's hiding in caves. He's hiding in the camps of Israel's enemies. This would have been an incredibly stressful season of David's life an incredibly dark season of David's life. And for a lot of that journey, he didn't have his friend physically by his side. But that doesn't mean that the friendship had ended. In fact, in 1 Samuel 23, we read that Saul is on his way to the town David's hiding in to show up and kill David. But Jonathan shows up to that town to encourage his friend. It says in this verse, Jonathan went to find David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. Don't be afraid, Jonathan reassured him. My father will never find you. You are going to be the king of Israel and I will be next to you as my father Saul is well aware. David at any moment could be killed and attacked by an angry king and his friend shows up. He shows up, he's a shoulder for him. He encourages him. He sits with him in his pain. Jonathan is saying, I understand what you're going through. You have every right to feel the way that you do, but don't forget about God. Stay strong in your faith. We know he has a bright future for you. You see, a loyal friend will sit with us in our pain, but they'll also point us back to God and remind us of the future we have in him. They don't try to discourage us from feeling a certain way. A loyal friend will never, they'll never make us feel pathetic or worthless. A loyal friend knows exactly our worth in God. They see it and they wanna make sure that we see it as well. What relationships do you have in your life right now that encourage you and point you back to God's best for you in your life? And I wanna make sure that you caught that, that loyal friends are not the ones that are loyal to you just so that you'll be loyal to them. Loyal friends are the ones that reflect God's love for you and point you back to God, not to themselves. We need to make sure that in our lives we have relationships that point us to and remind us of the most important relationship in our lives, and that's Jesus. And if you don't have this type of relationship in your life right now, I wanna encourage you to plug into the community opportunities right here at this church. There's a quote that says, loneliness is the most desperate words in all of the English language. You're not supposed to be lonely. Jesus knew this and he surrounded himself with friends. It's God's desire, it's our desire as a church community for you to be in relationship with others, to have deep and meaningful friendships in your life rooted in your relationship with Jesus. And I know it's not easy to make new friends and I know that it can't be forced, but how are you gonna have these types of relationships in your life unless you put yourself out there, unless you just give it a chance? especially in a safe environment like this church environment. Here's what I know to be true of the type of people in this church community. They exemplify everything that I talked today about a loyal heart. They understand self-sacrifice. They're helpers at their core. They encourage others daily, weekly, monthly. Now, they're not perfect. None of us are. But what I'm saying is that they understand these principles of loyalty because they have a God who has exemplified these things to them, even though they didn't earn it, even though they didn't deserve it. And this church community right here, it has been crucial for me in my own journey. And I know it will be crucial for you as well. And it's so easy to plug into the community right here in this church. All you have to do, one step, is just go to central.family. 
Just hit the quick link, join a group, and there you'll have an interest form that you'll just fill out. And one of our team members, they'll reach out to you. They'll give you all the different opportunities at all the different locations that we have, including our online location, to meet new friends, to start surrounding yourself with godly and loyal friendships in your life. Take a step of courage. Find loyal friends for you to walk through life with. David and Jonathan, they remain friends for the rest of their lives. In fact, David gets to show his loyalty to his friend even after Jonathan has died and passed on by showing compassion to Jonathan's lineage based on a promise he made Jonathan earlier in life. Jonathan had passed on, King Saul had passed on, and David asked if there's anyone left in Saul's lineage so that he can show compassion on them for Jonathan's sake. David's now the king at this point. He could hold a grudge against King Saul. He could, he could look for revenge by showing no compassion to this lineage, but David was gonna search far and wide for anyone that was left. And there was, there was one of Jonathan's sons left, and David found him and restored his standing with a seat at the king's table, with a seat at David's table. You see, he was gonna stop at nothing to stay loyal to a promise. And there's a promise that God offers us as well, that he loves us, that he will search far and wide for us. Listen, our sin, it makes us undeserving. But because of the sacrifice he made through his only son, we're offered a seat at the table. We didn't earn it, we don't deserve it, but through this sacrifice that he gives us, he gives us an example of what true friendship and loyalty looks like. Jesus says in John 15, he says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So even if you have no one else, if you hear nothing else today, what I want you to hear is that you have a friend in Jesus. He offers you his friendship. He gives you his loyalty. If you want it, if you want to receive it, if you want to show him back that he has your loyalty, then all you have to do is just pray this prayer after me. So if I could, could I have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes? If you want to accept Jesus' friendship in your life today, if you want to name him your personal Lord and Savior, just repeat these words after me, but believe and say them for yourself. Just say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that because of my sin, it separates me from you. But you offered me a way out. You sent your only son, Jesus, to die a death he didn't deserve. But because of that cross and because he rose from that grave, I can now spend eternity with you. So I ask for forgiveness from these sins. I recognize your loyalty to me. I wanna give my loyalty back. Come into my life, Jesus. Radically flip it upside down and give me hope and give me a future. And if you prayed that prayer for the first time today, if you named Jesus your Lord and Savior for the very first time today, with everybody's heads bowed, with everybody's eyes closed, would you just slip your hand up in the air? Just a hand saying before God, saying before me that I made that commitment to trust him with my life, to give him my life, to give him my loyalty. That's incredible. Thank you for those hands. Thank you for that confidence. Thank you for that courage. God, we give you these hands. We give you these lives that will now be forever changed because you showed up and you offered a way out of our sin, Father. Thank you for being a loyal God and thank you for teaching us what loyalty looks like. So as we go throughout our week, Father, just help us be loyal friends. Help us show the same loyalty that you've shown us by being self-sacrificing, by being helpful, by being encouraging, And by defending others, Father, let us show your love through everything we do. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Can you give it up for those that made decisions to follow Jesus today?
Listen, if that's you, we have a, a journal, a, a guide we wanna put in your hands. It just helps you with some next steps in this journey with Jesus. All you have to do is just go to central.family and just hit the quick link. I've decided to follow Jesus and we'll send that right to you. Well, at this time, we're gonna turn it over to our different locations that are gonna walk us through some next steps. What an incredible weekend. Such a powerful message from Pastor Nick Bodine on friendship. And thank you for so much for joining us. Thank you for including us into your time. And before we go, we wanna remind you about the Backpack Drive and sponsoring a child. Go to central.family, go to Backpack Drive, and for $35, you can help bring a hope to family, to the friends of our community that need it. And if you hold on to Romans 8, if God is for us, who could be against us? We'll see you next week. Happy 4th of July weekend.